Hello, friends. I'm Robin Garvin, the pastor of discipleship at Lake Grove Church. I want to welcome you to our teaching series, Encounters with Jesus. I'm so very glad that you've decided to join us as we consider together the life-changing encounters of eight biblical characters with Jesus. During each episode, through the teaching of one of our pastors or ministry directors, and afterwards, as you engage in the scripture passage and consider the reflection questions with your small group, your family, or by yourself, you'll explore how Jesus has changed the lives of people like Zacchaeus, Nicodemus, the woman at the well, Doubting Thomas, and many others. As you do so, you'll no doubt reflect on how your life has been and is being changed by Jesus. I pray that along the way, we will all once again be amazed by the transformative grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you as you view this episode of Encounters with Jesus. Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to this, our last installment of Encounters with Jesus. Today, we're going to consider the post-resurrection story of Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas's encounter with Jesus as recorded in John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. If you have your Bible, let's uh, look at that story together, and I'll read as you follow along silently. Let's listen together for God to speak. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, throughout history, when we hear doubting Thomas, um, we think of it as a negative or a pejorative label. We almost think of Thomas as kind of a mini Judas which underscores, I think, the tendency to consider doubt as the opposite of faith. I hope we'll discover today, uh, as we explore this brief but wonderful passage, that Thomas is actually a lot like you and me. The story of Doubting Thomas is set in a chapter, chapter 20, um, in John's Gospel, in which we observe a number of different responses to the resurrection the rising of Jesus from death to life. Well, the first response is that of Mary Magdalene. We find in verse two uh, that she comes to the tomb and finds it empty. Uh, she runs eventually to Peter and John. And she says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Well, Peter and John take off running for the tomb uh, John uh, looks into the tomb, sees the grave clothes, and believes. Peter also looks into the tomb, sees the grave clothes, with no indication that he believed. Both of them, Peter and John, return to their homes. Mary is left alone at the tomb, weeping. Uh, Jesus appears to Mary, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Believing him to be the gardener, the anguished Mary says, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. Mary. Mary. 
Mary hears Jesus calling her name. I love the beautiful particularity of this gospel. Jesus encounters real people with real names. Mary, Nicodemus, and many others who had encounters with Jesus and were changed by them. Well, Mary goes on uh, to tell the other disciples, I have seen the Lord. Well, the disciples, for their part, uh, are huddled together behind a closed door, a locked door in fear. Hardly a posture of robust faith. Jesus breaks into their locked up, fearful lives and says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. He gives to them the Holy Spirit, which is to say that he gives them his enduring presence. They are never alone. The disciples rejoiced, and we presume they believed. But in verse 24 of our passage, we discover that Thomas was not with the other disciples when Jesus came to them. And of course, we wonder why. Well, we could speculate that the darkness of the cross and fear drove him into hiding alone. Alone. Have you ever noticed how much our fears and despair are amplified when we're alone and have no one with whom we might share them? Thomas was all alone. The announcement of the others, we have seen the Lord, just frankly was not enough to conquer Thomas's fear and his despair. And he says, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in his side, I will not believe. Sometimes we read this as defiance, but I don't think that's Thomas's tone. I really don't. It's not so much, I will not, as I cannot. I cannot believe until I see an experience for myself. This, of course, is not the first time that Thomas has indicated his faith uh, in the form of a question. Um, you remember back in John chapter 14, uh, when Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure and speaks to them of going ahead of them to prepare a place for them uh, so that he would come back and take them to himself, that, thus that it would be with him forever. Of all the disciples listening uh, to Jesus' words, it is Thomas, the only one who voices confusion and a question. Lord, we don't, don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Well, getting back to John chapter 20, we consider the question posed by our passage. What will Jesus do with Thomas's doubt? Well, a week passes and the doors of the house where the disciples are gathered are still shut. Jesus comes among his disciples once again, and this time Jesus speaks to Thomas. Peace be with you. What does Jesus do with Thomas's doubt? Jesus shows up. He speaks peace into his life. Now notice, Thomas is welcomed into the peace of Christ before he can either apologize or defend himself or say anything. Jesus then invites Thomas to wrestle with his doubts. He invites him to touch his wounds. He invites him to touch tragedy. Now, some of you are likely familiar with uh, Italian painter uh, Caravaggio's um, early 17th century painting uh, entitled The Incredulity of St. Thomas. If you're not familiar with it, Google it. It's an it's a incredible picture. I love this painting. Um, I think Caravaggio gets it just right. What's clear in the painting is that Jesus has taken the hand of Thomas and guided it to his wounded side. Beautiful. You see, Jesus absorbs Thomas's doubts. 
He meets him where he is. Jesus doesn't gloss over what led Thomas to his doubts, the experience of tragedy. He allows Thomas to literally touch tragedy, to touch his wounds. Jesus encourages Thomas in this way. In the original language of our passage, Jesus says to him, no longer be unbelieving, but be believing. No longer be unbelieving, but be believing. Now with these words, Jesus is not scolding Thomas. He's encouraging him. Jesus is calling him to belief, which of course the scriptures uh, help us to understand means trust. Belief means trust. Jesus is calling Thomas to trust him. Like Thomas and all who would follow Jesus, we're not called to certainty. We're called to trust Jesus. And then there's Thomas's beautiful response, my Lord and my God. Thomas's response stands as the highest affirmation of Christ by any person in the gospel. My Lord and my God. Hear the personal nature of that confession. What the narrator proclaimed at the very beginning of the Gospel of John, verse 1 actually, of chapter 1, this non-doubting Thomas speaks from his own lips. You remember at the beginning of John's Gospel, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, Thomas affirms, my Lord and my God. So there's some takeaways from this passage, I think. Many, actually, but I'll touch upon a few. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. It is its companion. Doubt is the companion of faith. Some say that only believers can doubt. In fact, uh, Presbyterian minister Frederick Beekner once said, Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it alive and moving. I think that's quite true. But Jesus doesn't leave us in our doubts, uh, nor does Jesus chide us because of doubts. Jesus seems to accept doubts as normal. He shows up in the midst of our doubts. He gives us what we need to believe. He's eager to reveal himself to us. This is the pattern in the Gospel of John. Seeing is believing. As Jesus reveals himself, people come to believe. You remember back in chapter 4, uh, the story of uh, Jesus and the good, or rather the uh, woman at the well in Samaria. You remember that uh, she testifies to her whole village of the man that knows all about her and has, we presume, through this encounter, changed her life. Well, and the people of the village rush out to meet with Jesus for themselves, and they bear witness to that, saying that it's no longer because you, woman at the well, have testified to us, but now we have come to believe because we've seen it for ourselves. We've encountered Jesus for ourselves. Jesus is not afraid of our doubts. Um, he's not interested in giving us a faith that acts as though there is no tragedy. Rather, Jesus comes to us in the midst of tragedy and invites us to touch his hands and his side. He even guides our hands to touch his wounds, to touch tragedy. Well, the passage ends with Jesus saying in verse 29, blessed are those who have not seen and have come to believe. That construction implies that coming to believe, coming to trust in Jesus is a process. 30 years ago when I was um, examined to become uh, uh, ordained as a minister of word and sacrament, when you come before the presbytery uh, to be examined, you, you have to offer your statement of faith. And as I crafted that statement of faith, um, I had several sections. And each of the sections I began with the words, I have come to believe. I have come to believe. 
I wanted to bear witness to the reality that coming to trust Jesus for me in my life was a process, not an overnight transformation. Maybe it's been that way for you too. Coming to believe, coming to trust Jesus. John makes it clear in verse 31 of this 20th chapter that this is the purpose of his gospel, that those of us who would hear the witness offered in John's gospel to Jesus might come to believe. And through believing, through trusting in Jesus, that we might have life in Jesus' name, life in all its fullness. So the next time that you hear a reference to doubting Thomas, I want you to replace that word doubting. Instead of doubting Thomas, what about honest Thomas? Courageous Thomas? Tenacious Thomas? And ultimately, trusting Thomas? I think each of these descriptions gets us a lot closer to understanding Thomas and how his encounter with Jesus changed him forever. And it gets us closer to understanding how our encounter with Jesus might change us forever. Let's conclude uh, with prayer. Would you join me in prayer? Oh Lord Jesus, we thank you that you do not reject us as we, like Thomas, wrestle with doubts and fears. We thank you that, like Thomas, you meet us where we are and guide our hands to touch your wounds, to come to see and experience you for ourselves, and to experience the depth of your love for us. We thank you for your patience, your willingness to speak peace to us as we come to believe, as we come to trust you. May we join with honest, courageous, tenacious, trusting Thomas in confessing my Lord and my God. For that is indeed, Lord Jesus, who you are. May you be praised forever. Amen. Amen, friends.